registered. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Everybody's like nervous. To say again. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Is everybody staying dry? Yep. Yes. Yeah. This, this appears to be the time that Farrah wants to go out all the time now. <laughs> We had a uh, we had a black lab named Bear. Uh, he was about eighty five to ninety some pounds, and we were living up in Virginia when a hurricane came through there. And uh, again, I don't know what it was about. He just wanted to be outside, and uh, so I let him out in the backyard. We had, and no kidding, after he finished doing his business, he came back in, and just as he got in the door, the wind took our neighbor's fence and just blew it across the yard. Uh, it was a wooden fence that if uh, if bear had been had been there, he probably would have been taken out. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. You're a nut, man. <laughs> My daughter had a lab and another one, and she said uh, they were going to come over here, and it wasn't that bad a hurricane. She said, I'm, I don't think we could ever come over there because the dogs paced all night. Oh. She said they were like nervous wrecks, and they were running around, and they just, they just didn't know what was on, and they were all upset. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's just, just thunderstorms where Bear would get upset with, but normally not with that. He just thought it was, he thought it was like riding in a car, having his gums flap in the winds and his ears okay. flap like that. So, yeah. Well, we'll give it a couple of minutes. How many Dolphin fans are on the call right now? No Dolphin fans? <laughs> I don't, they look they're looking pretty good i was i was they're they're they're, they're moving down the field now but uh yep we got better things to talk about and do tonight if you were talking about the fish i'd say yeah uh, yeah no <laughs> uh, talk about that pro team we have down there in miami yeah. yep. we'll give it a couple of minutes to uh let folks get on board um, other than that is everybody doing well Carrie, you must have been excited. Marshall had a big win yesterday. They are undefeated. Yeah. It was like, what, 61 to 19 or something like that? It was 51 to 10. 51 to 10, okay. Yeah. My, Miami pulled out a squeaker against Virginia, so. Yeah. Good. Yeah. All right, if you're going to let me just talk sports now. <laughs> Steelers are in a battle against the Cowboys right now. All right. Um, I see the some. Hey, Bobby, I've been making a mistake. You know, I, I didn't even realize uh, that um, <laughs> that Gordon is someone we get that gets paid as well. There you go. Yeah. So. Just let him know he's he's a glorified <laughs> volunteer now. Yep. Well, I told him I said I'm gonna have to cut back on my praise of him now because I realize he's paid. So, hello, I'm iPhone. <laughs> I, all right, iPhone, I'm gonna fix you. I'm gonna fix you. I think I can. I didn't get a chance to do it, Tim. Pastor Tim. That's fine. Tim is fine as well. I'm. I think I can redo it here. Let's try. Look at this. Tell me if I spelled this right, though. Like the color white in the word cell. Is that right? With an S. I got it right? You got it right. Hi, Mary. Hi. Now, Joe, now Joe if you get hard, I'm going to put up there, I'm going to put Joe white sold. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, we've got, we've got a, a good quorum here, so we're going to go ahead and get started so we can stay in that, that time frame. So... Uh, let's, Wait, I'm in the wrong book here. What chapter are we in? We are still in. We're still in chapter three. We're gonna. Okay. We're gonna continue our conversation about the churches. Um, okay. Look, where where in chapter three? Uh, three verse one. Oh, you just started. Okay. I think we're picking up with Sardis tonight. Does that sound right to you guys? Yep. All right. Whatever you say. So let's uh, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll uh, we'll get started. So 
Jesus, we thank you uh, again um, that we we have this time, we have this technology um, to gather together and to reflect on uh, the history and the actions of churches in the past uh, and Christians of the past that we might learn from them and and might uh, uh, follow some of their examples and also. Uh, use their lives and their experiences um, to evaluate our own walk with you. Uh, and Lord, as we are, we are in this process of, of uh, having a Bible study, we probably can even hear the winds uh, whipping outside. And so we pray, Father, for the protection um, of those who are in the path, a, a more direct path with Ada. Um, and, and even those of us that... Uh, uh, are being impacted by the winds, but won't have the full brunt uh, of this. We pray, uh, Lord, for uh, a, a complete and quick uh, restoration. Uh, we pray, Father, there's been so many who have already been uh, impacted, whose lives have been turned upside down, um, whose livelihoods have been destroyed, whose families have been uh, uh, separated. Uh, and Lord, we pray that uh, those folks who are on the ground, who are searching, uh, who are providing healing, uh, who are providing uh, the resources in order to rebuild, uh, we just ask your blessing upon their efforts. And, uh, and then we continue to pray for our nation, Lord, as we, as we prepare for another transition. Uh, may it be a time for us to reflect on how uh, we might continue to be uh, citizens uh, of this world while remembering that we are citizens of your kingdom. And, uh, and then Lord, as we continue uh, each day to become even more aware of the effects of the pandemic, uh, we pray Lord that you could help us uh, to be a people who care for our neighbors by caring for ourselves, uh, our health and our ability to interact uh, in a healthy way. And uh, we ask your guidance and we pray for your leadership in all that we do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let me, um, I'm going to, so what I'm going to do is I get ready to share my screen is I'm going to mute uh, all of you. So, uh, because I'm recording this as well, and we want to try and keep it as, a, as clean of a copy as possible. But uh, Where is the, where's the video of last week that I missed? Uh, did you, you should, everybody should get an email from me. You, if you get it late in the week, that'll tell you what kind of week I've had. <laughs> so, so I think you probably got it yesterday or, uh, and so in there is the link and you just follow that link, uh, to the site and that'll take you to it. So it's a YouTube, it's a YouTube channel. Uh, if you go to, if, if you go to YouTube and you type in pastor Tim may, you may be able to find it that way, uh, as well. So, um, but let me, I'm going to mute us all and then I'm going to go to, so uh, when I mute you all, that means you have to unmute to speak. And so at any time, you know, feel free if I say something that, re, you know, that you have some questions about, just unmute yourself and we'll go from there. So, um, so let me hit my share screen. And pull up my PowerPoint. Okay. And then I need to know if you can just give me a thumbs up that you are seeing um, an image of a map. You got that? Thanks, Bobby. All right. So last week, uh, I think, Bruce, you were asking the question about where these churches were located again. And, uh, um, and so I just want to remind you that this area right here uh, is, in, um, is in Turkey, right over in this area over here. I'm sorry, up here in Smyrna uh, would be uh, Izmir, somewhere in that vicinity. Um, and so this would be a map of modern day Izmir to kind of give you a picture. But if I, I don't have it, I don't have the capability on this map to move it to uh, the right. But if I kept moving it across, so you've got Greece and things over here, but over beyond that is Rome. And so uh, what you're getting is Paul's, Paul's missionary tours and trips as he's went. And so we we have gone, through, we've talked about the Church of Ephesus, the Church of Smyrna, the Church of Pergamum, uh, Tyratira, and today we're going to talk about Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And you'll just keep in mind that most of these are, along here are those major seaports, 
Uh, and then what would be is these over the land uh, trade routes. Uh, and so as they traveled, uh, these would be major uh, cities, major uh, areas of commerce and growth uh, in that. And so, um, so let me take us now to the church of Sardis. And let me, I'm going to read to us uh, first uh, the message. Uh, and it says, and to the angel, and I'm at, I'm at chapter three, uh, verse one. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, these are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, we're going to hear a little bit more about the seven spirits and the seven stars later on. But what you may notice is that there's a little bit different of a description here. Uh, you remember when we were reading earlier, we would have some things that would say like uh, uh, a description like who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. There was usually this kind of description uh, about Jesus that was being revealed. But here it's a little bit, there's a, there's a little bit of a different shift that's occurring. Um, and, 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 and so the churches that we talk about here, Sardis, and uh, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, um, and really Sardis and Laodicea uh, really become the churches that are the most uh, rebuked. Um, they're considered the most perverse churches uh, that Jesus has a complaint against. And so there's a little bit different emphasis uh, that's going on here. But Jesus says, I know your works. You have a name of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is on the point of death. For I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard, obey it and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. Yet you have still a few persons in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. If you conquer, you will be clothed like them in white robes, and I will not blot your name out of the book of life. I will confess your name before my Father and before his angels. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So let's look at a little bit more in depth of what what the complaint is against the, the church in Sardis. So ch the church of Sardis has this reputation of one of being alive, but in actuality has this condition of, of death. And so that description would be, could be like, uh, they had a very active or powerful uh, worship experience. And yet uh, when they had this worship experience, it was like they, they were, uh, uh, receiving all of um, all that culture had to uh, uh, oh, hold on a second. I'm, I've, she disappeared and I can't, there it is. Um, Barbara came in. So I want to make sure I got her there. Uh, all right. So, so one of the things that would happen in this situation is uh so they would have, let's say, imagine that they had a seeker sensitive service. And so they were trying to bring in all the different uh, things of culture that would be attractive uh, to people of the culture. And yet they did not maintain this sense of awe and wonder uh, about God. There was, there was a lack of humility uh, in their worship. Or imagine that they had uh, these entertaining programs for children, youth, and adults, but there was no there was no transforming power of grace uh, in people's lives. And so, so they would come to, to this worship and they would feel alive. That you might even say they felt very, and I'm not, I'm not signaling out Pentecostal, I'm just using the word. They might feel very Pentecostal, very alive and very energized. And yet after they would leave their worship, uh, there was no life. There was, no, uh, uh, there was nothing behind the ways in which they lived. They just they just moved right back into the exact pattern of the culture. And one could not tell except that, you know, for an hour or two or four hours, they, they just separated uh, to go to church. And so uh, in this thing, 
Uh, that's what when Jesus says, I know your works. You have a name of being alive. So the reputation of this group was that they were alive, but in Jesus's mind, uh, they were dead. And so now he gives them an instruction and think about this, that, you know, all right, I've just pronounced you dead, but now wake up. And so if we hear that, that's actually a command of hope uh, to tell somebody you're dead. And then you say, wake up uh, is in my mind, it, it made me think of the story of Lazarus in the tomb. Remember that Lazarus had been in the tomb. The stone had been rolled. And, and uh, in fact, the sisters say, oh, you know, there'll be such a stench. Are you sure you want to do this kind of thing? And so Jesus is saying to the church of Sardis, listen, you have such a stench about you, but still there is hope. If you will wake up, you can be resurrected from the dead. Um, in fact, that's what we, you know, every church that we talk about that we say is a dead church, there's still the hope, there's still the possibility that out of that, there will be a newness, a rebirth, a, a resurrection kind of experience. And so he says, wake up and strengthen what remains and is on the point of death. And so in that point, uh, when he gives this message of hope, he's also saying there is a remnant around. Uh, there, there's a small body of people that, that can serve as a critical mass. And so I invite you to, to think back to uh, the prophet Elijah, who goes against the prophets of Baal. Uh, and, and, and really what's happening is that the people, the, the Israelites, uh, in the tens, the hundreds, and the thousands are, are walking away from Judaism, and they're embracing uh, this worship of Baal. And Baal was an agricultural god. It was a belief that that he was the one who made your crops grow and, and prosper. And so, so the, the farmers were turning to Baal and, and Elijah has this, this, uh, this battle with the priest of Baal. And you remember he takes, a, uh, takes an ox and he puts it on the altar and he douses it with water. And, he, and, and God you know, burns, make, burns his offering. And, assume, and after that great victory, Elijah runs away and uh, and, 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 and he's hunted by Jezebel. We talked about Jezebel last week. Uh, and in that, in that process, uh, Elijah is fearing for his life because in his mind, he's thinking, I'm the only one left. There's, you know, even though I've done this great work, uh, it, won't, it won't be sustained. And yet, as he's being nurtured and cared for, uh, God says to them, listen, there's a remnant. Uh, God always seems to work through a remnant. Um, you know, when Gideon is getting ready to go into battle, he's got this great army, and then, and then God wants to shrink that army uh, so that when the victory comes, uh, the people will know who was the one who authored uh, that victory. And so the same thing is happening here, is that Jesus is saying to the church of Sardis, you think you're alive, but you're actually dead. I want to speak words of hope to you. I want you to I want you to understand there is the possibility for, for resurrection. There is the possibility for new life because there is a remnant. Uh, and it's with that remnant that I will work. Uh, and he goes on and he says, uh, 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 I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Obey it. Uh, and obey it and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief at night. So their, their actions are not manifesting uh, Jesus' truth in the word, in the world. But if they will manifest those truths in the world, and some of those, some of those truths are that Jesus is the Messiah, uh, that these other gods that, that they're worshiping or participating in, uh, those worship are, are false gods. It's the belief that Jesus uh, is a God who who suffers with the marginalized and, the, and, the, and those who have been disillusioned, those who have been put out on the outskirts of, of society. Um, and so he says to them, uh, yet you still have a few persons in Sardis, I'm in verse four, who have not soiled their clothes, they will walk with me dressed in white for they are worthy. And so there's hope being offered that even for those who remain in the church of Sardis, a church that has been labeled as dead, and yet they remain faithful to who, who God is, uh, that there's hope for them, even as they start uh, from scratch uh, in that process. And I'm going to, um, 
in this concept, he's talking about this book of life. Uh, it says, if you conquer, uh, you will be clothed like them in white robes. And I will not blot your name out of the book of life. So the names that are included in the book of life are the names uh, who, will, who will become citizens of New Jerusalem. And so in the prayer, I, I talked about us being citizens of uh, this kingdom uh, here on earth, um, but we're also uh, called uh, to be citizens of God's kingdom. Uh, and so when we become Christians, when we're baptized, uh, we become citizens of the new Jerusalem. And that reference to new Jerusalem uh, is the new kingdom citizenship uh, that we're called to be into. Uh, and so it says here, uh, the, the interesting part of that, it says, I will not blot your name out of the book of life. So what he's talking about in that section is that when you become a Christian, and this is where it gets a little challenging here, because uh, we, you know, you wonder, are, is there a way in which to have your name blotted out of the book of life? Uh, and in this, in this scripture, it gives you this context that I will not blot your name out. So there is a suggestion that your name could be blotted out of the book of life. And, and for John, what he's emphasizing, remember again, his, his encouragement is trying to be that you stay the course in the midst of persecution, uh, in the midst of trials. Sometimes we Christians, especially in the modern era, we have, we have uh, embraced this idea that, hey, all I needed to do was ask Jesus into my heart, and then that's it. Uh, it's a one and done kind of thing, and there's no, there's no growth, there's no uh, progression uh, in our walk as, Christ as Christians, um, and we think, well, salvation, I've got salvation, it's all that matters, um, and yet in this context, in this, in this passage, uh, what, what we're being told is, hey, there, there's, again, we are saved by grace, not by our works, but even James and others will tell us that if there's no, if there's no works to support our faith, then there is no faith, and if there's no faith, then there really was no salvation. What you really did was embrace this, this uh, insurance policy uh, kind of scenario, uh, and so, um, I give you a reference that Paul talks to, uh, has talked about the book of life uh, in Philippians 4. But if you go back and you, and I'm going to look at this one quickly for us, because it, I think it helps explain what I'm trying to explain here in Exodus um, 32. This is a story of the golden calf. Uh, and so there's this, this issue, which is a constant issue uh, for the Israelites, and it becomes an issue for us. Uh, when we live in a culture that uh, presents so many other att attractive uh, possibilities that may not be uh, God. And, and here uh, Moses writes, but now if you will only forgive their sin, but if not, blot me out of the book that you have written. Uh, and so Moses is making a reference that there must be some kind of document, some kind of, of scroll in which Jesus or, or, or God is, is making this list of people who are citizens of his kingdom. And it's interesting what Moses says there. Listen, if, if nothing else, let me be the one uh, who takes on the penalty of, of the sins of these folks uh, who have worshiped this golden calf. And the reason I say it should be interesting to us is because that's exactly what Jesus does. He comes and he takes on the sins of the world so that our names are not blotted out of the book of life. Our names are written in the book of life as we confess Jesus as our Messiah, as we confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. The challenge for us is that we must continue to profess Jesus as the Messiah, Jesus as our Lord and for Savior. We we, we must continue to put forth works that demonstrate that Jesus is our Messiah, that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. To not do that, we risk having our names blotted out of the book of life, according to Revelation, which is what I've been talking about. Something is implied, which is cause for pause. I will not blot out. 
the implication is that our names are captured in the book of life and then our names could be removed. Now, I'm not talking about there, you know, I, I had a, a dear uh, fraternity brother um, from the Bahamas uh, who constantly worried about, you know, if he had committed the unpardonable sin. And I kept telling Brian, I said, Brian, just the fact that you are worried that you're, you've are you committed the unpardonable sin tells me that you haven't committed the unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin, you know, would be to say there is no God. Uh, it, it, to, to, uh, to come to a, a place in your life. Uh, so, so when I was, when I was young and, and I said that I was an atheist, I said, there is no God, right? Uh, that would, if I had lived, lived the remainder of my life of, of believing that there was no God, uh, then I would be forever separated from God. And, and as a person at that time who didn't believe God existed, it wouldn't have mattered because I didn't believe uh, until you come to that place of eternal judgment, uh, then, then it would probably matter at that point. Now, here I am as a Christian, as a pastor, and if I became a proclaimer of a false truth that there is no God, there is no Messiah, that would be considered the unpardonable sin. And that become, that's an issue for the early church because they're trying to figure out what do we do about these bishops? What do we do about these pastors who, because they wanted to save their necks, because they, in the, fa in the, in the midst of persecution, uh, in the midst of, of uh, watching their families being dragged from them, uh, what do we do if they recant their faith? Uh, imagine, you know, that if you were living in, in Korea or in China or in communist Russia or in Cuba uh, and you were or Iran you know or Afghanistan uh, and the threats of of your life were at stake and you said you know or you know uh, um, or if ISIS had you on the beach and was going to behead you and you chose not or as I said a few weeks ago we talked about Rachel's tears right if she said, you know, I, no, I, you're right, there is no God, um, what does that mean? Well, this is that point where, where God tells us uh, that we are not to be judges. We're not to be judgmental in that point, meaning that it's not our call to determine whether or not a name is blotted out of the book of life. Uh, it's kind of like the same story I, I talked to you about on Wednesday the workers in the vineyard, you know, here's a person who has showed up early in the morning, they've worked all day long, they, they handled the heat of the day, and when they, when they went to receive their reward, their pay for the day, they got their pay, and yet someone else showed up at four o'clock, and they got the same pay, right, so, and, and, the, and the laborer, uh, uh, the employee says, how can you question my generosity, and so my point to all this is one, yes, hear what the book, what Revelation is telling us, that there is, uh, there is um, the possibility a name can be captured and a name can be blotted out. But it's not for you or me to run around and say, hey, because that person stumbled, because that person uh, in, the, in the heat of, of that experience said, I don't believe in God. Uh, and, and did so in order to save their life or to save their family, it, it's not for us to say their name should be written out of the book of life. That's not, our, that's not our job. That's not even our position. That's the work of God. And if God chooses to be generous in those moments, then God chooses to be generous in those moments. Uh, our job in those moments is to say, how do I show grace? How do I show mercy? Because that's what we have received in that place. Uh, that's what it means when, when Jesus takes on the sins uh, of the world uh, in that process. Um, and so I want to, I want to invite us, I'm going to stop here to come back and, and think about the question, because this was the complaint against the, the church of Sardis, uh, that it thought it was spiritually alive, but Jesus says to them, uh, you are, you're actually spiritually dead. Uh, and so how might you evaluate if a church or how might you evaluate our church uh, on whether or not it is spiritually alive, or perhaps you 
want to discuss further something else that I've said. So we'll take a few minutes here. Pastor? Yes, ma'am. Uh, so are you saying that these people that are beheaded and they, they come and they say there is no God, yes, I to save their lives, that uh, God will still keep them, in book of, keep them in the book of life? What I'm saying is that I, I don't have, I don't have any room to make judgment on what God will do in those moments. So we don't know when they that say be, those things. That's what I, that's what, that's where I come from. That's where I'm there. That's where I land on that kind of question. You may, you may choose to land somewhere differently. I would caution against that because in that moment, when you're making that judgment, uh, you you are saying, in effect, these may not be your words, but you, in effect, are saying, I am God and I know what's going to happen. Huh. And God has God has proven time and again that when we think people are in, he, he moves them out. And when we think people are out, he moves them in. Pastor, is there any consideration or what your thoughts are of the consequences of being blotted out? Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, if I'm understanding your question, you're, I think you're asking, so is there a place of separation, of eternal separation, if your name yeah, is I mean, the, I've read in the context, you know, um, there's a, I forget exactly what it is, but there's a place where you go where there's gnash, weeping and gnashing of teeth, basically. Yeah, yeah. the term right. you look for is sheol. So, so the Jewish folks would have a terminology called the place of Sheol, which was an actual uh, burning garbage dump outside of the city. And so that's what they would describe as the place of, of eternal damnation. When we enter into the Middle Ages, we get Dante's Inferno. And that's really where we get this picture of what Satan looks like and what hell looks like. That's not until the Middle Ages um, time frame. So... If I'm understanding, if I'm understanding, please correct me, Bobby, is that your question is, is if your name is blotted out, uh, does that mean uh, there is a place where you get to be a citizen of, but not the place where you want to be a citizen of? Uh, and I would, right. have to, I would have to say uh, yes. Yeah. Tim, I was thinking, you know, a lot of our... Um, Christian friends from other denominations who I think we've all heard the phrase once saved, always saved, uh, and that feeling of eternal security. And that scripture, Revelation 3, 5, to me seems like a very clear indication that your name can be removed from the book of life, uh, which is much more Wesleyan. Yeah. Um, so I thought that was, that was kind of powerful. The other thing I, I just wanted to point out in the translation that I'm using I'm just using one from my Bible app, and it happens to be the English Standard Version. But um, the word that you said, uh, where it said perfect, mm -hmm. um, it was in verse 2. Yep. For I have not found your works perfect mm -hmm. in my sight. Mine says complete, and which to me kind of gives a different feel to that. Yeah. That it's not that they weren't doing anything right. It's just that it wasn't. It's like... <laughs> They, they weren't getting to the finish line. The point of why they were there, they just kind of weren't getting there, uh, which I thought was kind of a, an interesting take on it too. Yeah, keep in mind, as you just said, they were gathering for worship, mm -hmm. right? They were doing all the things that, that's the reason I've asked the question. They were doing the things that made them look like they were alive. There are things that we do uh, as a church that makes us look like uh, we're alive uh, as a church. Uh, and if you take if you take where we've been in Revelation and then you kind of go back to some of the complaints I've had about the bride of Christ, even what I talked about this morning. Right. I'm that's that's my complaint is that we we as a church, a church body, the bride of Christ, we look like we're alive. But, Which is why our works can't save us. Right. And that's I wanted to come back full to what you were just saying. The challenge for us as Wesleyans is that we we talk about um, we 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 argue against the once saved always saved uh, concept, but we also sometimes are guilty of 
of becoming works works work righteous heavy mm -hmm. on that point as well. And so we can we can be just as guilt producing on people that hey you better be careful. You know, uh, your works are not going to be found complete in God's sight kind of scenario. And so we, and that's the reason I would caution us on uh, getting into the game of trying to measure, is my faith, you know, as strong as someone else's faith or my works as good as someone else's work, as someone else's works. Um, we are called to be in community with one another, but we're also called to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. Can I ask a All question? Wonder. Uh, did you ask how we judge the church? Did I Isn't ask how you... we judge the church? Uh, yeah. Um, I didn't. I didn't use those words. Uh -huh. uh, what were you hearing that led you to ask that? Well, I thought you said, "How do you judge a church?" And I was saying, "I church. I go by that they should go by the words of the Bible." Okay. I went to a church when I first came up here that I was thinking of joining, and um, I didn't understand something about what they were doing. And I called the pre talked to the preacher and asked him, and he said, "Oh, you don't have to worry about that unless you ever get on one of the boards or something." And he didn't. I I went to another church, <laughs> so I, I thought that's what you were talking about. It's how we judge the church. Yeah. Um... So I would, I would, I was asking, how would you know that a church is spiritually alive? So one of the one of the criteria, if I heard you right, is that is is what is their what is their appreciation for the Bible? <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Now we have to be careful with our language as well when we talk about you know uh, you you've heard me say the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it, right? Right. Um, and sometimes that's what we mean when we say what we're saying until someone comes along and says, well, what about the, what about the verse in the Bible that says women should be quiet? <laughs> well, that's, that's a different, you know, I'm, I, we can go down a list of, of, of exceptions that we make. Uh, and so when, we just have to be mindful of how we use our language uh, about the Bible, mm -hmm. uh, because there are people who, who will tell you, I, I, I shared, I don't know, you know, sometimes these, these, these conversations I have with people, they, they merge in. So, yes. uh, uh, but I was sharing uh, about a trip that I was on with some other pastors, a seminary, a seminary student pastors who, who were of the, of the belief, the Bible says, says it, uh, I believe it, that settles it. And they firmly believe that women should not be pastors. And they were very vocal about that. Well, I don't believe that. In fact, I believe the first pastors were women. If you go and you read read the account, you know the the women were the ones who encountered Jesus, and they're the ones who went and taught the disciples to go and look. But I'm not I'm not trying to get into that debate here tonight. But I am just saying um, that we have to be uh, we have to we can't weaponize the Bible just like everything else. Um, so we have to we have to invite people to be able to to speak about how the Bible influences life. I'm hoping what you've gained from me in the short time that I've been with you thus far, I take the Bible very serious. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want the Bible to influence uh, all of my walk of life. But I, I'm not a literalist of the Bible. I don't literally believe uh, um, every single thing that's in the Bible. I question and challenge it. How are you guys hearing that? Because for some folks, that may sound like blasphemy. So let me let me answer. A little bit. You may want to rephrase that, Pastor. <laughs> What's that? I heard you, Marty, but I didn't see you. What? No, I'm over here. I'm off camera. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's, but I didn't hear you. But you'd rather be heard and not seen. <laughs> And, and for me, one of the things I would say, and, you know, in terms of what you're saying, what for me, when I read the Bible, I also read the context, because a lot of times we take things out of context and are not looking at what was happening then. Or, I mean, for example, if you look at the Old Testament and, and there's so many things that, you know, we could go by, but you're not reading it in terms of Jesus has already come and fulfilled that. Um, so for me, I think that's one of the things I look at when I had what I had you say about uh, questioning and asking, I do that too. 
And for me, the way I do that is reading God's word and then also reading it in context to find out what was happening and how does it apply to me. And it may, for me personally, it may apply in a different way than it did for the bib in biblical times, but it still applies. For me, I'm looking, how am I growing in my faith? Uh, even as I, that, that to me is how I took what you said. And you'll, you'll notice, you probably, by now, probably picked up on a rhythm on how I preach. You know, uh, in fact, uh, um, Matthew and Phyllis were joking with each other because Matthew knew when he's supposed to show the scripture verses. And Phyllis didn't know that when I'll say, now turn to your Bibles and then I'll spend five hours, you know, setting up the context before I read the scripture text. Right. Um, because I do exactly, that's, that's what's important to me. I want you to have the context to understand um where where i'm going in the sermon but also to hear what's happening that's exactly what john has done here you know is for us to understand the con that's how we've been looking at, at at this um so we understand the context again the context is he is he is instructing them how to live in the world but not be of the world and he's telling them there's consequences for those of you who live more in the world than you do about being not of the world and there's going to be a context when you try to straddle both both worlds, uh, uh, and and those kind of and there's a con there's a con there's a challenge if you try to to separate yourself completely from the world and you don't have any interaction because now you're not bringing people into a relationship with Christ. That was the Church of Ephesus uh, kind of scenario. Well, I think Pastor Tim, you know, the question that you asked originally about um, what would that dead church look like what would a church look like today mm. i my mind immediately went back to matthew 28 and great commission so it's one thing to show up and have church and and do worship uh but are we winning souls for the kingdom are we making disciples of the world are we serving the poor are we doing the things that we are supposed to do mm. I, I wondered then could that be a church that is dead? Is that we're very inwardly faced? Sure, sure. As opposed to being a church that is, yeah, you, you, you have salvation, you are saved and you worship so that. Mm -hmm. And the so that is the important part. What are we doing with the what we have? And it's not us just being about us and being a community of worshipers that are uh, for ourselves but that we are worshiping and, and, and serving so that others may come to know Christ. Yeah, and, I'm, and I think if you go back and you look at these, these seven churches, again, these are seven specific churches, but they're also seven churches that represent the global, the global church, that it gives, you, it gives you some criteria on what to look for for a church that is alive in Christ, right? Uh, I think we would say, there's a problem if somebody goes into a church service, hears a message about love, and then walks out of the service, you know, and flips somebody off because they cut them off on the on the interstate right after church. I would, I would, you know, we would wonder what, you know, uh, where 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 was where was their heart in the in the worship service kind of thing. I was having a conversation with somebody after church today, and and I said, you know, the Bible talks about our tongues. You know, we will bless with that tongue and we will curse with that tongue um and so we just need to you know that's that's what that's what john is challenging us uh, as we read about these churches are we consistent are we intentional uh, in our practices and so um again i think what i try to do each sunday is is give you an intentional action to take for the week to help you uh be alive in christ to be thinking about uh, that process uh, along the way. So let me um, move on, uh, or else we won't do all this. Uh, I wanted to speak, but I didn't. Oh, wait, wait, I'm sorry. I won't cut you off. Who was that? I lost it. Whoops. Uh, maybe that was me. Do you hear me? I think, I, is it Nan? Yeah. Okay. I, I just this whole time, the question you put up again, how do we know? Oh, sorry. There's my dog. You're fine. How do we know if a church is alive spiritually? Yeah. I just yeah. kept thinking, I don't, hi, I don't go to your church. 
I hope it's okay that I'm taking this study. Perfect. Yes. Yeah, oh, oh, so, so, but um, a big thing that comes across to me is how the people in the church actually treat each other. Yeah. Very good. It's going to tell me a lot about if the church is really alive spiritually. Yeah. And the challenge there, I mean, that's certainly, that's, that's a helpful indicator, um, but it's not the only indicator. Uh, well, and also I would like to add that they're teaching the gospel. Okay. Yeah. The reason I say that, we've discovered that our, that our group, that the neighborhood here in the cul-de-sac, cul-de-sac, uh, is a very friendly neighborhood, right? Uh, the uh, um, apparently it's a it's a definitely a dog loving community out here. So you certainly meet a lot of folks as soon as you as you get a dog. And the girl, you know, we've got now we've got kids that are constantly ringing the doorbell. So I'm getting a BB gun here pretty soon. But I'm kidding, kidding. <laughs> Sorry, but it's a friendly it's a friendly neighborhood, right? Uh, and so if I was looking to buy a home, this would be a nice neighborhood to buy a home in, but that doesn't necessarily mean uh, it's a healthy neighborhood. I'd have to learn more about it. Uh, you know, we have to have some, you got to have some crisis that breaks up. Like when I first moved here, you know, I got a little note that said my mailbox was crooked. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. It's in a concrete block. How can it be crooked? Right. And I had certain perceptions about my neighbors. Uh, in that in that process and so so you got to have conflict you there's a lot that goes into that but the biggest challenge or the biggest things that what I'm hearing you say um, all of you is that have spoken to that is that one of the ways that you notice a church whether a church is alive or whether it's dead is by the actions that it takes and are those actions in, uh, con in consistent and are they intentional and when we say intentional, what we mean is, do they line up with the example of Christ when we talk about a church? Right. And so we have to ask, you know, so when when Jesus gets a letter in the mail that says your mailbox is crooked, what is Jesus's reaction to it? I can guarantee you it wasn't the same reaction I had. <laughs> he, his reaction would have been like, ah, these are the things of the world. Let me tell you, in my house, <laughs> all mailboxes are perfect, right? I mean, I'm being a little crazy here, but but I can just tell you, that's that's part of the process for us uh, is is stepping back uh, and asking, am I intentionally lo looking, evaluating my life, and measuring it not against some other Christian, not against some other church? not against some other idea. Am I measuring it against the standard that was established by Jesus? And I can't help but tell you that if you do that, you're going to spend a whole lot of time, because I spend a whole lot of time saying, oh Lord, here am I in need of a savior, right? Here am I, you know, uh, wanting to keep growing. And the more that I do that, the more I'm evaluating my life, my words, my actions, my thoughts, my teaching against the standard of Christ. I'm not measuring them against Charles Stanley or Andy Stanley or, or you name, you know, or the bishop or what. It, it's against Christ. Right? That's, and then I become a person who says, you know, I am grateful for God's grace, right? Because God, while, while Jesus sets the standard of perfection, he does not anticipate that I'm going to achieve that standard of perfection on this side of heaven. Is that making some sense to folks? Okay. Now, the problem with the church of Sardis. Um, I'm sorry, one thing then from what you're saying. I'm sorry, I'm not letting you go ahead. No, 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 you're fine. Oh. So would you say that if you were an attendee of the Church of Sardis, you wouldn't be looking for a new church? Uh, yes. And, and I can, uh, uh, the reason I'm hesitating on the answer now is I can tell you, there have been numerous times when I thought I'd about, I was going to look for a new vocation. Because I oftentimes felt like, 
you know, that the church as a whole uh, has oftentimes operated. Uh, and I have wanted to leave my calling. And, but every time I have gone down that path, uh, it just felt like I could never, I could, I would be like, I would be like Jonah, uh, running away from the calling. And I just, I just could not. Uh, so I meant if you were not a pastor, but you were a member of the church of Sardis, you would stay with the church. No. Um, if, so if I, so for example, if I went to a, a worship, if I went to a church that had really good worship, right? And my, and my, my spirit was moved. Um, but then when I left that church and no one reached out to me, you know, let's say when my mom or my dad died or, or there was no way for me to be engaged in a small group to, to, to help me continue growing. If there was no preaching that was challenging me to uh, evaluate, uh, am I becoming more loving? Um, then I would not associate with the church of Sardis. Thank you. Does that mean you're hanging up on me now? <laughs> no, nope, I'm still here. You're stuck with me. No, I'm glad you're here with me. I'm glad you're here with me. Oh my goodness. I'm just- Can, a, I, say, so cool. hey, hey, can I say something? Yes. Can please. you hear me? We can. Say yeah, something. hi. It's Cindy. Um, so I just, I don't know how long Nan has been visiting our church, but uh, because of COVID-19, a lot of things have changed. Um, we used to always hug and kiss each other before service, after service. I mean, we're very much uh, a, like a family. So, I mean, a lot of people want that again. And it's like, we have to restrain ourselves. You know, when I see somebody I know and I love, I just have to say, whoa, got my mask on, you know. So I'm just trying to say that we used to be more maybe spiritual, uh, loving, you could see it, you could feel it. And I feel that we try to be that way, but within the confines of the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, from my perspective, we have changed a lot. <laughs> yeah, and it's- uh, but yeah. In the future, you know, we will be back to where we used to be, hopefully if the world goes back and these uncertain times, I don't know. But I think we try to do the best that we can and it may not look like, you know, we are that way, but deep down inside, I think most of us are very caring and loving and, and concerned about our church and want to do better, you know? So I just had to say that. Yeah, thank you. From my perspective. And I, I, would, I would say to all of you, I mean, if you go back and, um, you look at like the first eight or nine sermons that I preached when I got here, when I laid out what is a healthy, mature Christian, I'm kind of laying out what, what I think is, is a, a church that is the opposite that's being described in Sardis uh, kind of scenario. But uh, we're going to, can, can, yep. Can I share something real quick? It, it, this story reminded me of a story that Bishop Gwen had told me when I was in his office one day and he was talking about um, when he was the Bishop of, North Carolina, and it came time for uh, one of the churches for ch to have a change in pastors, and he'd gone there to visit the church and doing some research on the church. Well, the council had gotten together with him and to t talk about what kind of what they were looking for in a pastor and all of that. And he told him, he said, I just had to tell him point blank. He said, you know what? If it were up to me, he said, now this is a church that they were having like 800 in worship every Sunday had a huge music program, very vibrant, um, tons of programs and stuff going on. And he said, you know, if it were up to me, he said, I would close this church. I would board up the windows, lock the doors and lock up and close this church. And they were just obviously stunned. And he said, going back and look at your records, he said, over 10 years, you have not had a single profession of faith. And he said, you're playing church. And that's kind of what I was thinking of when we were talking about Sardis. It looks like they're doing a lot of cool stuff. The people are gathering, they're having a good time and they're doing all this, but their work isn't complete. Like I said, they're not finishing the work. They're 
the, the fellowship part seems to be alive and well, but that's not what they're there to do is to fellowship. They're there to, uh, to create disciples and they're not doing it. And it just kind of made me think of that church in Sardis. Yeah. And I mean, that's, and that's part of the process that I'm, I'm uh, guiding and facilitating with the, the leadership of the church. It's also asking those, the, that kind of question that I'm asking is so that you can, you can think about what, what, uh, how will you know that you are a spiritually healthy church? So, I mean, if we're, if we're not leading people into a relationship with Christ and what are we doing? Right. But, and you might also ask if we're not leading people into uh, full-time ministry of uh, whatever that may look like, you know, what, what, uh, and what I mean by that is like learning, teaching people how to, to be a lawyer and be a full-time minister while working in a law firm. Right. Uh, to be, to be a workplace chaplain kind of scenario so you could you could feel called to that profession and yet still be a christian witness uh, in that experience to be a, an actuary or an accountant or to be a, a counselor you know or to be a school teacher right uh and still and be a workplace chaplain uh, in that kind of setting but if we're not preparing people in church for that then what are we what are we doing we're playing church right and that's that was the, that was the that was one of the critiques against the Church of Sardis. The real the real critique was they're gathering for worship. They're call, they're calling out God's name, and then on Monday morning when they went back into the workplace, you couldn't tell them from the heathen or the pagans. They were acting and they were acting the same. They were doing the same thing. They sounded the same way, right? Um, Christians are called to be different uh, in that. So. I'm going to, I'm going to do a flash on uh, the church of Philadelphia. Uh, and then we'll have to, we'll, you guys were asking, when did I think we were going to finish revelation? Yeah. That's, that'll give you a clue. <laughs> so, church of uh, Philadelphia and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write: These are the words of the Holy one, the true one who has the key of David who opens uh, and no one will shut who shuts and no one opens. And so he's, he's describing a door that when he opens it, no one can shut it. And when he closes it, no one can open it. He's the, he's the one in control uh, of that key. I know your works. Look, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those of the synagogue of Satan. You know what? I'm going to, I'm, I'm looking at this. Uh, I'm going to bring us back because to be honest with you, I think I would not do us justice if I tried to rush through um, the church of Philadelphia because there it's an important church uh, for us to look, look at. Um, uh, thank you, pastor. What's no, that? I said, thank you. No rushing. <laughs> well, and I, I really wish, because uh, just to give you kind of a, an idea as we think about this, I was, I don't see Gertrude on here. Um, but one of the things for you to think about, you know, is what would it have been like? And, and, and we don't have to, we don't, it's easier to pull out that example of the confessing church in Germany in World War II. But also you can go and think about, you know, uh, uh, the white evangelical church during the civil rights movement, right? And, and what is it, so the confessing church uh, in Nazi Germany had to go against the state church. The state church was, the, it was the church that was endorsed by the state. The, the church, the church of Christ had endorsed the actions of Adolf Hitler, right? And there is this confessing church that was saying, you guys are nuts. You're insane. And as a result, those folks end up being persecuted. They end up being uh, um, imprisoned, sent off to concentration camps. Uh, if you ever heard of the name Dietrich Bonhoeffer, yep. right? uh, he's part of that confessing movement. And so what we'll be looking at in the Church of Philadelphia is what is it like to be a church that is speaking against uh, the, the, the more influential, the more powerful church? Uh, of that day called the synagogue of that time 
and remain and remain faithful. And so, it, you know, again, um, well, we'll we'll talk about it. We'll talk we'll talk about it next week. How's that for a cliffhanger? <laughs> so, before we go, any 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 last anything that's gonna um, that you want to have resolved before we we call it a night. We're all good. All your hatches are battened down and ready for ready for the wind. Yes. Yes. Go buy a kite. Yeah. So. All right, my friends. Well, thank you uh, for being with us tonight, and may may God continue to bless you, and may God continue to guide you, and may you may you receive the reward uh, of a wonderful night of rest. Um, because when you wake tomorrow, it'll be a new day, a new week and a new opportunity to share God's love with a broken and hurting world. Amen. 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 Hey guys. Thank, Amen. You. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you, Pastor Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Have a Thank good evening. You. Carrie, uh, you've been enjoying the music. Good night, everybody. Good night, good night everybody. Bye, Cindy.